Madam Secretary, thank you very much for doing this interview. Um, you wrote in the first chapter of your book, of the day after the defeat, you said, I felt I had let everyone down because I had. How did you let them down? Because I didn't win. And not only did I not win, but I lost to someone who I believed during the campaign uh, would be uh, a very um, divisive figure and was not ready to be president. And so it's an odd experience having won more votes, but having lost uh, the opportunity to serve as president. Uh, and uh, I felt very, you know, very sorry about that. And one thing, Matt, if I had lost to another kind of Republican, mm. I would have been disappointed, no doubt about it. Uh, but this was something different. But how much was this your own failure as a candidate? Oh, it was certainly part of it. Um, and as I write in the book and mm. try to be as candid as I can, mm. I think there were several problems with my candidacy. Uh, one, uh, the kind of leadership that I was offering based on my experience, my preparation, uh, the ideas I had, what I knew I could do because I had served in the Senate for eight years, I'd been Secretary of State mm. for four years, was not a perfect match with the anger and the resentment that the that a significant percentage of the electorate. And how would you have answered that anger? I mean, would you have should you have been more angry in the campaign? Should no, you have I, channeled some of that anger? Yeah, I, I think I think that that's a difficult question to answer because mm. I don't think anger is a strategy. But I think I could have done more to uh, reflect it and to be uh, clearly sympathetic with the legitimate mm. part of the yeah. anger. Because there's two kinds of anger. There was economic anxiety where people were feeling. You know, they hadn't recovered, they, didn't, they weren't back on a track to be economically uh, self-sufficient and successful. Mm. Then there was all the cultural anger on race and immigration. And but there was also anger against you. I mean, people really hated you. Well, they were it, driven to the polls by hatred of Hillary. Well, it, there, there was a lot of negativity on both sides. That's, that's true. But I came out of the Secretary of State job with a 69% mm. approval rating. I was, by many measures, the most popular public person at that time in uh, America, and certainly in the Obama cabinet and administration. They really did a job on me, Matt. They and did. And I was not as successful in beating it back. And of yeah. course, then they had the help of the Russians, which mm. you know, was we'll, something We'll get onto the Russians in a minute. But I mean, the fact that you actually lost vote share by 1% amongst women running against an openly misogynist candidate who had bragged on tape about assaulting women. I mean, that is astonishing. Well, How is but, that possible? But let, let's look at the facts. Number one, I actually got, you're talking about white women, because yes. I won women oh, yeah. overall. But you went down from 44% to for Obama to 43% no, amongst, no, no. Among, according to Nate Silver. Yeah, uh, among okay. white women, mm -hmm. Among college-educated yeah. white women, I eked out a very small, really tiny uh, win. Yeah. I actually got more votes from white women uh, than President Obama had in 2012. However, there were three things at work. One, a long problem with Democratic nominees and white voters, mm. period. That goes back uh, to my husband and before. Secondly, uh, there was a lot of anxiety about my, um, uh, my vote share among white uh, voters, in part because I was standing up on race mm. and guns and things that are quite culturally controversial. And then finally, I would say, I don't blame, I don't blame voters for not voting for me. Um, they were given a lot of wrong information. And the critically wrong information came right at the end, as I write in the book, from this letter by the FBI mm, director, sure. Jim Comey. So I was winning among women by all of our measures, uh, white women, again, we're talking, mm. uh, because I won overwhelmingly among black sure. and, and uh. Latina women. I was winning, and then my momentum stopped, and the numbers dropped. But one could say that you should have really got almost every female vote in the country after the fact that Donald Trump was openly misogynist. Yes, he was, and there's no I doubt mean, about that. How did you not get every female vote in the country? Well, frankly? because gender doesn't yet uh, serve as the kind of motivator for voting that race has in our country. But is least. it also because you, your dynastic appeal, or perhaps it was the opposite, the fact that you called Clinton, the fact that you were first lady, basically trumped any novelty, if you forgive the term, yeah. <laughs> 
um, of being the first female president of the United States. Well, you know People looked at your name and your legacy mm -hmm. more than they looked yeah. at your gender. But, I, but that doesn't explain why I led all the way through, why I won the primary by four million votes, why I was winning. We had a great convention. I was thought to have won all three debates. That doesn't explain it, Matt. So that's why I had to really dig deep. And yes, I take responsibility. Obviously, there were things I must have been able to do differently in order to have won. Mm. But at the end, there was this really perfect storm. And so you had the Comey letter and you had, and we will get to this, the enormous impact of the Russian theft of emails, the release of them by WikiLeaks, mm. and basically now a, uh, a part of the Russian intelligence uh, apparatus, mm. and the weaponization of that. So these were all new phenomena. So you're still blaming others more than yourself? No. I Look, I take ultimate responsibility. I don't blame others, but I think it's important that people understand what happened. It's easy to say, well, you know, she wasn't a good candidate. Then why did I lead all the way to the end? Why did I get nominated overwhelmingly? Did people lie at the polls? No, I think there were intervening events that caused people to worry, to have second thoughts. And I think it's important to go into those, as I do in the book, because Russia's not going away as a threat mm. to Western democracy. Uh, and what we've got to figure out is what happened in order to prevent it from happening again. Let's be blunt here. Are you saying that your election was robbed by a combination of uh, Comey's intervention at the last minute and Russian interference? I think there's a good argument that could be made to that effect. Certainly the Russian interference affected voters' decision making. People say, well, did it affect the outcome? When you have a massive propaganda effort to prevent people from thinking straight because they're being flooded with false information, and you have people who are searching, trying to make sense of it, but every search engine, every site they go into is repeating these fabrications, then yes, it affected the thought processes of voters. And my loss, one positive thing that came from it is that people in Europe could see very clearly and understood the role that Russia was playing because they were clearly trying to elect my opponent. So if it hadn't been for Russian interference, would you now be president of the United States? Well, it was such a close election. As you know, I won the popular vote overwhelmingly mm. and lost the electoral college vote by, by 77,000 votes. 77, votes yes. So that's a yes then? Well, I'm not going to go that far because we're still investigating all of this. And I hope that someone will get to the bottom of it for the future, not so much for the past. You ran in 2008 and you lost against Barack Obama. Mm -hmm. And I remember your husband at the time <clears throat> was incensed by the fact that Obama was so doing so well in the primary campaign. He called the Obama phenomenon a fairy tale. You lost to some extent then because you were the establishment candidate in an era of insurrection. So could one not say that if you hadn't been this ambitious the second time round, um, your ambition was the thing that stands between the world and President Joe Biden. <laughs> well, he didn't run, you know. But he would have run if you hadn't run. Well, there's no evidence of that. Um, he would know, have look, run if you look, hadn't run. you know, I, will, I write about ambition in the book because I've never heard a man ask, be asked about his ambition. And people in our country can run for whatever reason they choose. Mm. And that should include women as well. Of course. And. I was clearly encouraged to run by President Obama. I write about that in the book. I was supported by the people who had helped to elect him. So yes, it was certainly my motivation because I thought I would be a good president and I still sitting here today think I would be a good president. And uh, there was a new kind of campaign that was being run on the other side that nobody had ever faced before. But I asked the question because there is something extraordinary about the fact that you, you know, as a woman, you know, the first female president of the United States, you were failed by this openly misogynist candidate. So is it perhaps, I'm just putting this out there, that having been first lady before, that people didn't look at you as much as, you know, Angela Merkel of the United States, but as the Eva Peron? Oh, I don't think so. I think that's very dramatic and even melodramatic. I don't think that's so. That's not melodramatic. Yeah, I thought that was no, no, quite a subtle no, little no, question look, there. I, I ran for the Senate in New York, a place that yeah. had never elected a woman, a very tough political environment. I got elected twice. I'm very proud of that. I ran against Barack Obama. It was a really tough primary, extremely mm. close, unlike this last one. 
he turns around and asks me to be in his cabinet yeah. because he knew that I could make a contribution, and that was all you know who I was and what but I. But could But maybe you uh, were around offer. for too long. I mean, there was no novelty. <laughs> no, there was no novelty. You had the experience, well, but there so was no novelty you're, factor. You're anymore. talking about, but you you know there, the people, the person I ran against in the primary, uh, yeah. the person you mentioned who didn't get in and and uh, was not uh, actually competing. You know, my goodness, they've yeah. been around a long time okay. too. All right. So the the, the I don't, one I don't who, believe that you know. As readers have told me who've read the book, um, it lays out a case, and I'm happy to, you know, have any discussion with anyone who has a different theory. But the evidence points to the Jim Comey mm. letter and the Russian interference as being the factors at the very end of that campaign. Okay, so do you think that regarding Russian interference, that President Trump could be impeached at the end of this process? I mean, Bob Mueller and 16 investigators yeah. are looking into Trump mm -hmm. and Russia. I don't know, because there are different ways that uh, a president can be held accountable. Uh, that's what the investigations are about. And at the end of the process, whether it's congressional or the special counsel, uh, there will be findings. Whether they include the president or not, we're, we're going to have to wait to see. What I'm more concerned about is what he's actually doing in mm. office now much of which I warned against when I was running against him. And that uh, is you know, the real problem that I think we face. You called him during the campaign, you say this in the book as well, that he was a clear and present danger to the United States and indeed the world. Mm -hmm. You still believe that? Unfortunately, I do. And there's, what does that mean? Well, there's, a, there's, there's some real world examples right now. Um, apparently, he's going to decertify uh, the Iran nuclear This agreement. afternoon. Yeah. Yes, and it's a very major mistake. Uh, there is no evidence that on the nuclear program, Iran has cheated in the agreement that uh, the UK and uh, other powers, along with the United States, entered into with Iran. So basically for political reasons or for personal reasons, it's unclear which, he is basically throwing open the door to Iran's nuclear program one more time. I think that is very dangerous. Whether it's North Korea or Iran, mm -hmm. is he endangering world peace? Well, he certainly is behaving in an impulsive uh, way that uh, confuses people, uh, which I think is not good for the stability of the world. There could be accidental interpretations of his tweets and his bellicose statements mm. that I think might uh, prove to be uh, quite uh, dangerous. So yes, and when you think about it, why if you're having a serious threat from the development of nuclear weapons in North Korea and the potential capacity for them to have missiles mm. that could carry a nuclear weapon uh, to Japan, even to the United States, why would you also pick a fight with Iran? So th the choices he's making are ones that I think are destabilizing and dangerous. So yes, he is endangering world peace. That's uh, what you're saying. Well, he certainly is causing many people to worry about the future. And that could be dangerous because there could be miscalculations. Just want to get back to the campaign um, just briefly. The one word that always came up when people mentioned Hillary Clinton was email. Mm, yes, right? it was. I mean, with Trump, word. there were lots mm. of words, not all of yeah. them flattering, but right. with you, it was right. email. Right, right. I mean, how much do you regret this, you know, the, the private email server? Oh, of course. And the way that you allowed the other side to define that yeah. as an example of your sense of entitlement and, mm. you know, establishment and all the rest yeah, of it. Yeah, no, I mean, look, I, I say in the book, it was a, a dumb mistake, but it was a dumber scandal. And the press bought into it hook, line, and sinker in the United States, and that's why it was the most Could covered Could you have said story. more in the beginning to distance yourself from Everything that? I said in the beginning turned out to be true in the end. It mm. didn't, but it didn't matter. And we had put it to rest. You know, there was an investigation, mm. which I knew would lead nowhere. It led nowhere. It was over in July. And then on October 28th, it was raised again. So of mm. course people, voters, are going to say, what is going on? And there's a lot of anecdotal as well as mm. uh, research data, which basically had people saying, well, I was going to vote for her, mm. but I can't if, you know, if she's being investigated again, which was nonsense. So you have one thing in common with Donald Trump. You both hate Jim Comey. <laughs> well, I have a lot more basis for it than he does. <laughs> and I don't hate anybody. I just have raised the questions about the decisions he made, which are to this day inexplicable. Harvey Weinstein. Mm. 
friend of yours, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Gave lots of, you know, he gave lots of money to your campaign over time. Is Not right? a lot, but he gave money. How much? Oh, I don't know, twelve, sixteen thousand dollars something like that. Have you given it back or given it to charity? We're going to. Yeah, we're going to. How long will it take? Oh, I mean, it, it, surely you can just write a check and give the money back, can't you? Or? Well, it, it has to come out of our campaign funds. Right. So there's a little more, but it will be done. And that, that but that's not the issue. The issue really is how terrible uh, his behavior was. And finally, women have come forward to speak out about it, which they hadn't before for all the reasons uh, that they uh, relate. You are a, a beacon of feminism. You talk of, you know, for women's rights. You knew Harvey Weinstein well. At what stage, and you must have known the rumors about him, Harvey no, will be no, Harvey. I'm not, no, I did not. I, I did not I mean, know. There were, everyone knew rumors about him, not specific cases, but well, everyone knew that Harvey Weinstein, apparently, in his circle, um, was a little bit, you know. Well, I, all I can tell you is that I did not hear those things. Look, we just elected a person who admitted sexual assault to the presidency. Uh, so there's a lot of other issues that are swirling around these uh, kinds of behaviors that need to be addressed. And I think it's uh, important that we stay focused and shine a bright spotlight and try to get people to understand how damaging this is. And the women coming forward is the only way that that story will be told. So, you know, in America, we seem to be turning the clock back. <clears throat> We've got a misogynist as president, and you've got open whites, openly white supremacists, racists on the streets of Charlottesville. Yeah. What yeah. on earth is going on? Well, one thing that has happened, Matt, is that in the Trump campaign, the white supremacy uh, point of view and those who practice it was given great uh, opportunity to be uh, part of the campaign, to express themselves, uh, people in major positions, uh, people who had before been put to the margins of our politics, like David Duke, the former Ku Klux Klan Grand mm. Wizard, were embraced by the Trump campaign. You know, people who used to have maybe 12 followers online all of a sudden had thousands because Donald Trump running for president was retweeting their white supremacist, racist, uh, comments. He went for the base, for his base, and you didn't go enough for your base. You missed a trick there, didn't you? You could have no. done the same thing for your for your crowd. No, I, no, I think that's way, way too simplistic. I think that what he did was to unleash feelings that were not that far below the surface, but which had been kept in check. George W. Bush rejected that kind of behavior. John mm. McCain publicly, when he ran against Barack Obama, rejected comments that were aimed at Obama. So Republican leaders in recent times have tried to walk a different line. Not that they maybe didn't take votes from people who felt that mm. way, but they did not pander to them. And then along comes Trump, who's from the very first day of his campaign, you know, goes against immigrants, goes against Mexicans, calling them you know, criminals and rapists mm. and the like. And then the, he was off to the races. Whatever scapegoat you wanted, yeah. whatever prejudice you held, was going to be fed by Donald Trump. President Trump has said that he will run again. Mm. Yeah, he's already he been could, starting he, to collect money. And he could win again, couldn't he? Well, we don't know. We have no way of knowing but that. He right could now, win again. well, right now his approval is very, very low. He's down to what we think of as his hardcore base of 30, 34%. Yeah. Uh, and people who, maybe voted for him, not because they approved of him, but because they wanted a Supreme Court seat, mm. which they got, or they wanted a big tax cut, which they're trying to get, um, may or may not uh, continue to support him. And he will probably get uh, challenges from uh, the Republican Party. What is your biggest regret in one word? Losing. <laughs> Makes sense. Madam Secretary. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you.